Use it for your glory, we pray. In the precious name of Jesus and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Worship team, band, production crew at the back, who no one ever thanks, but you're amazing. And it wouldn't happen without you. Um, It's such a joy to be here today. As I said, my name's Dave, and uh, I'm a senior pastor of Hills Baptist Church. And uh, we're a We've got a couple of campuses. We're looking at planning a third. Um, but I just, as we were worshipping, and particularly as I, as I saw Beck taking three young cherubs down the aisle, <laughs> crying, I really just felt to, to pause. And I know she's doing kids' ministry, but I've been in that place. Carl, I've been in that place. We, we planted what is now Verdun, Littlehampton, six years ago with three children very close together, as I said, and very young. And I know what it's like to be up here preaching, but I don't want to know what it's like to be the mother having to deal with that and run him out. I just wanted to honour Beck in this moment. Um, Because when, you know, as pastors, it can be busy. There can be a lot of pull and attention and people wanting us, but the children want us and mum is dealing with that. So Beck, you might not hear it, but we honour you, we're praying for you, we love you, and we appreciate you and what you do. Can we give her a round of applause as we do that? Because we can't do what we do without them. Amen, Carl? Amen. Um, if you've got a Bible, can you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3? And I do bring you, I guess, welcome. I give uh, a, a big hello from Hills Baptist. Uh, I... My story is that I was raised Uniting Church. I was saved Pentecostal Church. I worked in a Lutheran school and trained with some Lutheran theology for 10 years, and now I pastor a Baptist church. So I'm not quite sure what box I fit into. In fact, I don't think I fit into any box. I I got myself in a little bit of trouble with the Baptist churches during my ordination, where they asked me my sense of call to the Baptist church, and Sometimes I, like, I say stuff without thinking, and I said to them, oh, I have no sense of call to the Baptist church. <laughs> and they looked at me like, what the heck? I said, no, 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 I'm called to the kingdom of God. And because I'm called to the kingdom and he's planted me here at Hills, I'm, I'm going to go through this process. But my call is kingdom, not denominational. And uh, a part of that, I think, is reflected at Hills, it's reflected at Ignite, it's reflected that I have great friends who are flag-waving, tongue-speaking Pentecostals and great friends who are hand-in-lap, reverent, Lutheran, Catholic, Anglican, and I just think we're called, we are the body, and everyone has a part to play, and everyone has a, a song to sing, and a, a a word to offer, and so it's such a joy to be able to be a part of the kingdom of God, isn't it? And City Light East is a part of the kingdom of God. Hills Baptist is a part of the kingdom of God. Churches down the road are a part of the kingdom of God, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ on about the same mission to see Jesus glorified in all things. So I just honour you, Carl, for this step of faith. I love you, man. Thank you for championing us and believing in us for many years, and we are right here with you. One year old, hey? How good. First birthday. How amazing. What? Look, just look around for a second. Look what God has done in one. You know, planting churches is hard work. It's not easy. And so I commend you and honour you for one year. And as I sat with the Lord to think about what I wanted to preach, what he wanted to preach, I should say. What I, I always say, God, what do you want to say to your people? And I had one of those weeks this week. We had one of those weeks where the elders meeting went past midnight. We had, we had a lot going on within the life of our church and it was every temptation to just go to the vault and pull a message out and say, I'll just, you know, heat this one up and preach it. <laughs> and on Friday as I sat there with the Lord saying, Lord, what do you want me to say? Which one of these sermons do you want me to preach? <laughs> And I just felt like he said, none of them. You you, you can't bring stale bread on a first birthday. It's got to be fresh bread. And 
I just felt like he said, I just need you to encourage these people. Encourage them. I want to bring an encouragement today. And this, the word that I feel like we're going to bring is, is not necessarily something you haven't heard before. But my prayer is that it deeply encourages you. And it encourages you, Carl. It encourages the elders. It encourages all of you to keep running the race. We just sung that. Run the race. Run the race with perseverance. And so we're going to see in 2 Timothy 3. And we're going to begin at verse 14 and go through to chapter 4. I'm going to read these words. I invite you to sit with them and let them wash over you as we get into it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 14, Paul is writing to his beloved son, Timothy. Paul is in prison. He's coming to the end of the days. This is the last letter he will ever write. We don't know whether this is days, weeks, months. Different theologians will tell you different things, but what we do know is it's the last thing he ever writes before his head is literally severed from his body. And as Paul's final days begin to become a reality for him, his attention and his focus goes to this young lad, Timothy. Oh, this is so special. Don't ever read 2 Timothy flippantly. This is so special as he writes to his beloved son and in verse 14 of chapter 3 he says, but as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, come on, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth. Everyone say truth. And turn aside to myths. But you, Timothy... You, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge the duties of your ministry. Now listen to this. He says, for I, for four chapters, it's been you, Timothy, you, Timothy, you, Timothy, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only for me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. What a word. You know, last year, I'm one of five children in my family, and so when we get together for family birthdays, there's a reasonable horde around the table, right? And uh, we all gather together, lots of young children. And when we sing happy birthday, it's now become a bit of a tradition that the, the candles get lit and all the young people start going, ha, and they wait until everyone's ready, right? And it used to be when they were younger that we'd just hold the happy birthday and then we'd go. But... This year, or last year, I should say, my son Benji, in hearing that, ha, he held it for as long as he could, and then just randomly he went, ha, samentia, what a miss, <laughs> The Lion King, anyone? Are you with me? And let us down this, like, a complete distraction. Really funny, like everyone laughed, but it totally took us off the track of where we were supposed to go, which was to sing happy birthday to my mother. And it's funny how when you're younger and it's early on, everyone knows what you're supposed to do, everyone knows what you're going to do, and you just stay the course and it's, 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 you know, it's kind of easy to stick to that clear guide. But as you get older, there's other thoughts that start to creep in. 
There's other things that start to happen around us and distractions can creep in and little old Benji just gets this little thought from the Lion King and then sends us and then everyone starts singing that and we're completely away from the mission that we began with, which was to sing Happy Birthday. Do you know that's actually true for the church too? That the older we get, the longer that we're in something, the more other stuff starts to happen. The more that there's distractions that start to come into play, the more that there's, there's just other things to deal with. And it's really easy if we're not careful to become distracted and start singing a different song from the song we were supposed to sing. To start walking a different direction from the direction God had called us to walk. And we can end up doing the metaphorical Lion King instead of walking in the truth, instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we don't even realise it, but all of a sudden we're fixing our eyes on, you know, it's good stuff, but it's peripheral stuff. And I really felt today that the Lord wanted to bring an encouragement to this church, City Light East, that through every season, through every storm, through all the sunshine, whatever's going on in life, stay the course. Fix your eyes on Christ. There will be other things that you have to deal with. There will be things to navigate over time, but keep your eyes on the truth and chase after the truth with everything that you have. Encourage one another in it daily. Hold fast to the truth. That you will get, like Paul, to the end of your days and you will have the Timothys in your life and you can come to the end of your days and you, like Paul, can say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And look at them saying, now you go and do the same. Amen? That's the call of City Light East. And I was reminded of this uh, recently. When I was 21 years old, I had the privilege of going to Melbourne for a conference. And I was studying education at the time at Tabor. And I was, because uh, I actually taught Josh Moon. He's up here. It's, nothing's more weird when you walk into a church and someone says, hi, Mr. Shepherd." <laughs> <laughs> it makes you feel old. But 21 years old, studying at Tabor, studying education at Tabor, and my ministry hero, a guy called David Wilkerson, who uh, established Teen Challenge, wrote The Cross and the Switchblade, my like all-time ministry hero, was, I, I discovered was coming to Melbourne for a, a, a conference for senior pastors. And I'm like, I'm a 21-year-old education student, but I'm going, Right? because he's my ministry hero. And so I went to this conference with a couple of friends of mine, some of whom are also now pastors. And for some reason, they let us in and, you know, it was great. We sat at the back and David Wilkerson was amazing. But I'll actually, the message I remember is not a word from David Wilkerson. The word I remember is a word from his son, Gary. And Gary got up there one day and he, he started preaching. He told this story that as they'd started this church and the church grew and it was, it was reasonably healthy and a, you know, a size of sort of a few hundred people and it was exciting and God was doing good stuff, but then it began to stagnate. And so Gary became, I guess, a little bit disillusioned. He, you know, he thought, well, I'm David Wilkerson's son. You know, I plant churches and these things should take off. We should be seeing thousands of people saved every year. This is what it should look like. So he began to become conflicted. And so we thought, I know what I need to do. I need some help. I'm going to go to a conference. And so he went to a conference on you know, uh, the emerging church. And so he sat there and he listened to all these great teachers. He thought, fantastic, this is the solution to our problem. He went back to his church after that conference, said to his elders, I know what the problem is. We need to be an emerging church. So they put together all the paraphernalia. They prepared. They spent months preaching into this. We're going to be an emerging church. They did all this stuff. And the day came and they launched the fact that we're an emerging church. And the day they launched, there was a whole heap of people within his church who didn't want to be an emerging church. So they walked out. And there was a few people who walked in because they were excited about the emerging church movement, but at the end of the day, the church wasn't growing, it was declining. So he thought, oh no, what am I going to do? I need some help, I'm going to go to another conference. And this time he went to a conference about the purpose-driven church. 
He bought the book, he read the book, he heard the great speakers, like, this is the solution. We're called to be a purpose-driven church. So he came back to his elders and said, guys, I know what the problem is. We're gonna be a purpose-driven church. So they put the paraphernalia together, they did all the work, they spent months preaching into it, and all the emerging church people who had come were like, we don't wanna be a purpose-driven church, we wanna be the emerging church. So they walked out the doors. And a few other people joined, but actually the church numbers as a whole started to decline. And Gary said to us, he goes, so do you know what I did? I needed some help. Where did I go? I went to another conference. And he went to this other conference and he got all excited about it. He said this conference was about the seeker-sensitive church. It was like, I know what the problem is. And he went through the whole process again, came back to the church. We're going to be a seeker-sensitive church. Did all this stuff and obviously there was a whole heap of people who were there for the purpose-driven church and the emerging church and they were trying to figure out what they looked like. He goes, we're going to be a seeker-sensitive church. So a whole bunch of people left and some people came in and he said the church was just so confused and conflicted and didn't know what they were doing and what started as a healthy church was increasingly becoming an unhealthy church. And he said, what am I going to do? And he goes, I know what I need to do. I'm going to go to another conference. And as he went to this conference, he said he sat down and on the first night, a choir of two or three hundred people literally came out of the stage on a platform that rose and hovered above the thing. And he just said, he just sat there and went, if this is what it takes to build the kingdom of God, I'm done. And he got up and he walked out and he went to his hotel room and he just started to bawl his eyes out. And he said, Lord, you promised me that on, you know, you promised us that you would build your church and the gates of Hades won't prevail against it. You promised me that you were going to use me to grow your kingdom and look at me, I'm a mess and I, I can't do this. I can't have a choir of 200 people falling out of the floor. I don't even have 200 people in my church anymore. He's like, what the heck am I supposed to do? And he was weeping, he was weeping. And he said, in that moment, He just sensed that still small voice of the Lord say to him, I have not forsaken you, you have forsaken me. And he said he went to the word and this is, he did one of those, you know, where you say, all right, God. (laughs) I don't recommend that, but that's what he did. And he said he pointed at 2 Timothy 4. And he began to talk about 2 Timothy 4. Four, and he began to talk about a Christ-centered church. And, you know, for me as a 21-year-old, in that moment, God just did something in my heart. It was like he just said to me, Dave, one day you are going to lead a church, and I want you to get this right now, and I want you to get it good. There are trendy churches. There are traditional churches. But your call is to be a truthful church. It is to preach the word. It is to not become distracted by the winds and waves of this world, by all the cultural trends. Preach the word. Be a Christ-centered church, a word-centered church. Build it right. At that conference, Gary talked about how he went back to his elders and they were kind of trembling. (laughs) Oh no, what are we going to be now? And they said, what are we going to be, pastor? And he said, do you know what? We're just going to start at Genesis 1 and we're going to teach the Bible. He said, they just went to Genesis 1. They just started teaching the Bible from the beginning of the Bible to the end. And he said, funnily enough, week after week, the church began to grow. He goes, we didn't have a thousand people walk through the doors, but for the first time in a long time, we were starting to become healthy. People were getting baptised. People were in life groups or small groups or connect groups or whatever it is you call them. They were studying the Word of God. Marriages were getting stronger. Young people were getting saved. He said we were healthy. And the reason we were healthy is because instead of chasing after all the trends, we were walking in the truth. That we would be a Christ-centred, truth-centred church. That City Light East, I just came to encourage you this morning on your first birthday, stay the course. Keep preaching the word, brother. Keep preaching truth. Believe this thing. This is the inspired word of God. This is not just a book. 
This is life. It is life. Read it, meditate on it, chew on it, talk about it, rest in it and proclaim it. Be a Christ-centred church. I want to very quickly, while we're here, let's just run through this. What does it look like? What is Paul saying as he, as he brings this to, to Timothy? You know, in, um, he says, In the presence of God and in Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. In the Greek, that actually uh, a better rendering of that is solemn charge. I bring you this solemn charge. You know what solemn means? It means serious, right? A serious charge. This is like when you do a wedding, you do a solemnization at the beginning. And a solemnization means we begin by talking about the seriousness of this covenant that you're about to in, enter into. You know, when I sit down with a couple and we're going we're gonna to spend some time before they get married talking about the nature of marriage, I talk about what it means to, for a husband to die to self and for a, for a wife to submit to her husband who is dying to himself. We talk about covenant and the nature of till death do us part. I'm like, what you're entering into, it's not about a dress, it's not about a cake, it's not about having a party. This is about death to self and life to each other. It's about becoming one, right? I did it with one couple and both of them, their faces went white and they were like, I don't know if we can do this. I'm like, no, you can, no, 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 don't, like, you can. You can, you can by the grace of God. It's not easy, but you can. If you let the Spirit of God move in and through your marriage and you walk in that covenant commitment, it's beautiful, but it's serious, right? And this is what Paul is saying to Timothy. He's saying, I'm not, this isn't a flippant thing that I'm about to tell you. This is the last chapter I will ever write before I die. And if I'm going to start dropping some wisdom, now is the time to drop wisdom, Yes. And the wisdom I'm going to give you is very serious. And the seriousness of this is, Timothy, preach the word. If you're going to lead a church, and especially we know Timothy ended up in Ephesus, which had a whole lot of stuff going on, like this metropolis where there was trade and there was philosophy and there was different cultures. There's pagan worship. There's shrine prostitution. There's a lot happening in Ephesus. And he's like, Timothy, your job in the midst of this, don't be persuaded by the things of this world. Don't be pushed to the left or to the right. Don't even allow just a, a snippet of falsehood to enter in. No, you preach the word and let the word do what the word will do. Hold fast to truth, Timothy, in this day, in this day, because guess what? There's a whole lot of people who are looking for what their itching ears would have them here. How many of you know that we're living in that time right now? Everyone's looking to hear what they want to hear and you can go anywhere you, like it's very easy on the internet to find someone to tell you what you want to hear. Your truth. That's good for you, but that's not for me. That's my truth. And the call of the church is to say, no, 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 there's a truth there is the way, the truth, and the life, and his name is Jesus. And we're going to point you to Jesus. We're going to proclaim the truth of Jesus. And we're not bending. He is the truth. He is the truth. It's a solemn charge. Now, why should we be this Christ-centered church? Why should we preach the church? Why should we preach Jesus? I'm going to just throw some scripture at you. Listen to this. This is what the Bible says about the nature of Christ. From Ephesians 1 verse 20, God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. There are some things in church life that are necessary, but they are not central. 
What is central is Christ because he is the head of the church, amen? Colossians 1, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He, Paul's just boasting about Jesus now. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. The supremacy, first of all things. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus himself says in John 8, truly, truly, I tell you that before Abraham was, I am. Because of who Jesus is, he is God, we preach him. We preach him, we proclaim him, we declare him, and we keep our eyes on him, and we stick fast to him, because that is what we are about. Build a Christ-centered, truth-filled church. Now watch this. As Paul goes on, and he starts to say, when, when should you, in what way should you preach? How should you preach? In what situation should you be proclaiming the truth? Preach the word, it says, be prepared, what? In season and out of season. That means in good times and bad. When life's going well, when the numbers are coming in, yeah, when the coffee's great, when people are excited, when you're celebrating one year and everyone's like, woo, this is awesome. Preach Jesus. Preach the truth. Preach the word. Hold fast to the word. Guess what? When stuff's going badly, when people are leaving, when things are difficult, when there's complex issues that you're navigating and you want to sort of speak into those things. No, what does he say? Preach the word. Preach the truth in season and out of season, in good times and bad times. Preach the word. How are we to do it? We are called to correct, rebuke and encourage Church, City Light, there are going to be times when people come up on this pulpit and they give you a rocket where you will need to be corrected and rebuked. Those who have a soft heart because their eyes are on Christ and you are in the Word will receive that joyfully. Doesn't mean it won't sting, but will receive it joyfully. I've had to be corrected and rebuked many, many times over my life. It started with my mother when I was a child. And it continues today. The question is, can we receive correction and rebuke? Leaders, can we receive correction and rebuke? Because we are not above it. We do it and we proclaim it, but we must also be open to receiving it. Correct and rebuke, but not without encouragement. We're called to build one another up. You know, what does the author of Hebrews say? Let us encourage one another. Sorry, I'm used to that sort of feedback. <laughs> Encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Are we encouraging one another? Don't ever just assume. Like so often in the church, we just assume. Can I, husbands, can I speak to you for a second? <laughs> Out of personal experience, Sometimes I just assume that my beautiful wife knows that I love her. And sometimes I actually have to take the time to look her in the inside. Babe, I love you. Sometimes I've got to take her out on a date. Sometimes I've got to go above and beyond so that she knows. Yeah? All right, guys, we tend to be a bit more oblivious as long as there's dinner on the table occasionally. <laughs> We're happy. But this is true in the church. You know, the church, we've got to build each other up. We've got to encourage one another. We've got to look into each other's eyes and say, hey, firstly, how are you going? Secondly, let me, let me speak life into you. Some churches are, are great at the correct and rebuke. And some churches take great pride in correction and rebuking. And we take very little energy to encourage and edify. We're called to do both. Correct and rebuke and encourage. Can we be a church, City Light East, that is going to correct and rebuke and in, 
courage. Hey? How else? With great patience and careful instruction. Patience takes time. Who hates being patient here? Gosh, some of you are a lot more holy than I am. (laughs) Patience is not a strong suit of mine, but I know it's a virtue. But we are called to, with great patience, correct, rebuke and encourage. That means it's going to take time. It's one year in City Light East. It's one year in. It's exciting. But as Carl got up here and he introduced elders and members, this is not a consumer-driven thing. The church is not a consumer entity. The church is a body. And the body takes time to develop and grow. And there are going to be things that happen in this place, in this community that you don't like. The question is, do you up and leave because there's something better next door? Or do you believe that this is my family? And because this is my family and because this is where God has planted me, I am going to stay and endure with great patience through correction and rebuking and encouraging that I might be built up and equipped and edified in the truth. May City Light East be known as a church years from now where people stayed the course. This is what I think we forsake from the traditional church. The church I grew up in, my mum and dad have faithfully served at Westbourne Park Uniting Church for 70 years. And I'll tell you what, there's been many, many times where they've wanted to get up and get out of there and it would have been a whole lot easier. But do you know what? They have stayed. And do you know why they've stayed? Because God called them to. And when God calls you to a place, you stay in a place until he says, now it's time for you to go. And if God doesn't say go, we stay. Because he has a work for us in the body to correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience that they might be built up in the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? May this one year birthday mark a time where This goes from a place where, yeah, this is cool. This is exciting. This is interested to this is family. And my roots are going down deep right now. I'm laying the foundation. I'm laying the concrete and my feet are in it. And the only way my feet get out is when Jesus Christ comes with a jackhammer and digs them out and says, now you got to go. It's not a flippant thing. And if Carl gets rogue and starts preaching something different, what do we do? Correct, rebuke and encourage. He's not going to go rogue (laughs) because he's got a whole lot of good people speaking into his life, including these two elders. But we correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience say, preach the word of God. Preach the word of God. Um, Band, you can come up and in a minute we're going to move into a time of communion. But I want to just bring just a couple of other thoughts if that's all right. You know, Alastair Begg, he says the primary objective is that the word of God in being proclaimed may create by the spirit of God a divine encounter with God himself. Let me say that again. The primary objective is that the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, may create a divine encounter with God himself. Friends, why do we preach the truth? Not because it's sexy, but because it's sufficient. We preach the truth, not because it's sexy, but because it's sufficient. It is our daily bread. It is what we need for sustenance. You know, we can preach the bells and whistles. We can preach the chocolates and the lollies and all of that. And it might look great, but it's not going to sustain us through trial. So we preach the truth. We preach the bread of life. We preach Jesus Christ, who is the living word. And as we preach the living word, that which is God breathed and useful for all things will edify the saints and it will keep us enduring through difficult times. 
And so we preach the Word because Jesus is the living Word and the Spirit is the Spirit of truth, as it says in John 16. The Word of God does the work of God by the Spirit of God in the people of God. We preach the truth not so that we can gain more information, but so that we can have a heart revelation of who He is. Amen? We preach the Word, not so that we can entertain people, but so we can edify people. We preach the Word so that, not so we can leave and go, man, I was blessed, but so that we can be built up. Because the goal is not to have a great time. The goal is to grow into the likeness of Christ. And the only thing that's gonna do that is the Spirit of God through the Word of God as it is proclaimed. I love what the author of, Uh, Romans says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Preaching is the means by which the gift of righteousness through faith is delivered. When this is proclaimed. So we preach the truth, amen? We preach the truth. A word-centered church. And you know, when Paul finishes this little exhortation to Timothy, he says, I have received... I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I have kept the faith, and now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Friends, Paul is looking towards a crown, but that crown for him is not a crown that he gets to jump around in heaven being like, look at me, look at me. The crown is a gift of righteousness that he gets to lay at the feet of Jesus. He gets to lay every crown at the feet of the Lamb of God who was slain. And he gets to say, holy, 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 worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. He gets to join the angelic hosts of heaven for all of eternity. The elders around the throne, the living creatures around the throne, the sea of glass, the rainbow. He gets to sit in that place and he goes, what good is a crown? And we live in a world where everyone's pursuing a crown. Everyone wants fame and acclaim. Everyone's looking for followers. Everyone's looking for instant gratification. But the reason we preach this is because it shows us that it's not about any of that. It's all about the Lamb of God who was slain. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Him. And any reward we have on earth is simply for the goal and the joy of laying it straight back down at His feet. That's what this is about. That's what the church is about. That's what planting churches is about. Is so that people would have that revelation of His gift of life and grace and mercy and love and goodness and all of this and then go, wow, I want to give you everything. It's, it doesn't matter if there's a big crowd or a small crowd. All that matters is that we put a crown at His feet because it's all about Him. It's all about Him. And so as we celebrate one year at City Light East, I celebrate the fact that this is exactly what you're doing, that you are preaching the Word, that you are preaching truth, that we are leading people to the Lamb. Amen? And long may it continue. Long may it continue. May you take this morning as an encouragement from this day forward and for every day that City Light East is here. (laughs) They were a truth-centred, truth-honouring, Christ-declaring, gospel-loving group of believers who honour Him above everything else and stand arm in arm, correcting, rebuking and encouraging with all patience until the day the Lord calls us home. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite Carl up and he's going to lead us in a time of communion.
Thank you, Dave. I feel so encouraged, mate. Really appreciate that. And we're a church.